Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to this online event from the Natural History Museum. I'm Connor and I'll be your host for today's discussion. Over the next 45 minutes, we're going to explore the complex relationships between animals, viruses and us, humans. Now, today's event is part of a year-long program called Our Broken Planet, How We Got Here and Ways to Fix It in which we engage with the urgent challenges we all face while living in a planetary emergency. And we're also going to discover the existing and emerging solutions pioneered around the world tackling these challenges. This program will combine live online events, like the one you're currently watching, uh, digital content hosted on our website, and a brand new display opening up in the museum later this year. You can keep updated on our website and also on our social media channels. One last thing before we again begin. This event is for you. So if you've got any questions or comments, please do pop them in the chat at the side and we'll come to as many as we've got time for in the show today. Now, uh, please do keep it polite, though, because we're here to have an open discussion about some important issues. If you enjoy the show, please do consider making a donation, if you can, using the donate button next to the chat. We are a charity and community support is important. We hugely appreciate any amount that you feel comfortable donating. Now, on to today's topic. One year ago, the museum shut its doors to the public for the longest period since the Second World War, as the UK went into its first lockdown as a result of the global outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. The serious effects of the pandemic have been felt by us all, not just in the UK, but globally, driving economic and social inequality. For many people, communities and countries around the world, the impacts continue to pervade into every aspect of our lives. Now, today we'd like to set the record straight on the true nature of pandemics, like the one we're currently in, how they begin, and what we might need to do collectively to prevent them from reoccurring in the future. To do this, we are joined by Professor Kate Jones, world-leading professor of ecology and biodiversity at UCL. Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. <laughs> well, thanks very much for inviting me. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Oh, well, yes, I'm, I'm really excited about our discussion today. Um, well, I can imagine you've got quite a busy schedule, so we'll get right into <laughs> it. Um, can you give us a little taste <clears throat> about what exactly your research entails? Yeah, I, um, I'm really interested in this interface between ecological health and human health and how that's being impacted by you know, global changes that we see around the planet, like land use change and climate change. So I'm really interested in that interface. And I've got a particular interest in infectious diseases. Those are things which, um, you know, cause infections in humans and are typically passed to uh, from animals to people. So wow. I've got a particular effect like Ebola and SARS. And then mm -hmm. I've also got a really big interest in, in monitoring and developing new tools for monitoring ecosystems. So I'm, I'm leading the way in, in understanding how to use artificial intelligence, for example, wow. in, in tracking different species and, and ecosystem health. So particularly for bats and how they echolocate. And I've used that as a kind of, um, a, 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 to track bat populations across the world. So to understand how they're doing, because they leak this kind of information out of themselves into the environment. And you can kind of pick it up to use it as a, as a proxy for how well they're doing. Wow, so uh, quite <laughs> a lot of stuff on the sounds of it. Um, so as you say, um, your research does um, include a lot about bats. And if I'm not mistaken, you've got quite a big interest in them. Um, in your opinion, what is it about bats that makes them such amazing animals? <laughs> well, they are amazing. They really are. You know, they've, they've got a huge diversity. So, um, you know, one in five mammal species on the planet is a bat. So there's, they're the second largest group of animals. So only wow. rodents have got uh, more species in them. And they can cut, they can go from like tiny things like the bumblebee bat, which is like two grams to one and a half kilograms, two meter wide wingspan for the for a fruit bat, the false vampire bat that eats fruit and lives in in India, uh, Southeast Asia. So they've got this huge diversity of um, body sizes, head shapes. They eat like 
weirdly different things. They, three species drink blood, so these are vampire bats, but over 1,400 other species uh, eat um, fruit, pollinate flowers, um, they eat insects, they're a, a really a good um, insect regulator. So um, they kind of do farmers a favor by controlling insect and, and also um, uh, pests and also disease carrying uh, insects. So they control those numbers. And they're also important pollinators of lots of um, important plants which are important to us. So like agave, for example, which oh, yeah. produces tequila for margaritas. So that's a very, very important. important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds think alike. <laughs> um so yeah so so really important to their ecosystems but also as human beings now um bats are obviously extremely important to the conversation we're having today um what is it that um makes bats so pertinent to the issue of of pathogens so basically microorganisms that um, can carry diseases um, into all uh, different creatures? Yeah, I mean, that's it's a really interesting question. And um, I've been looking at kind of bat life histories for a number of years, and I actually did start, started uh, my PhD, my research career on that. So that was about 200 years ago. <laughs> but I, I was really interested in why, what bats are doing and why are they different? You know, is it to do with flight? Is it, you know, what what is it, how hmm. are they? life and it, it turns out that bats live really slowly so they reproduce really slowly they have small litter sizes they they kind of do everything slowly and they, they kind of uh, avoid a lot of the mortality which um, impacts lots of other uh, species like rodents for example and they can live these really really long lives so they don't get eaten and they live these long lives oh, wow. and so when people started to look at um, how they do this <laughs> They discovered that bats are, you know, say living up to 40 years, you know, that and a similarly sized uh, mammal would be like 18 months or something. And so it was like, how are they doing this? And it turns out that they're really, really good at repairing DNA. And they've got cellular mechanisms which respond to any damage in DNA and repair it really quickly. So they have very low rates of cancer. They live these very long lives. And also, and really importantly for infectious disease, they can deal with any kind of invasion of, of the cell. So a virus, for example, mimics a lot of the uh, activity of, of damaging DNA. And so that they can, they have these immune systems which are, are, are really on all the time. And these viruses um, are adapted to cope with this kind of situation. And it's thought that the reason they're really good at, at doing this is because of flight. So flight's really metabolically expensive. And so yeah. if you're flying all the time, you're creating all these oxidative uh, products from expending energy, you're damaging DNA, and they've evolved to respond to this and repair it. And this is like <laughs> had a cascade effect on, on their metabolisms, how long they live, how slowly they live. So I think right. they're just fascinating, you know, really fascinating animals. Right. OK, so um, so that was a really interesting point about them, them having quite a, a fast metabolism and quite a good um, like uh, immunity as well. So um, just up front, uh, would you be able to explain to us the current scientific understanding on the link between COVID-19 and bats? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the kind of they have this immune system and and it's thought that viruses which are um, adapted to be in this kind of very hostile situation are kind of uh, kind of good at evading immune system responses. And uh, so it's thought that viral pathogens from bats in particular are um, kind of dangerous to other taxa if they jump over. So if they jump over into different species, they're kind of you know, pre-adapted to this immune system, which is already on. And so when they get into other animals and humans, for example, um, it does call, it can cause some problems. And this is what we think's happened in the current pandemic, that um, there was, you know, some evidence that coronaviruses themselves, which are a huge group of, of viruses, 
but they evolved with bats for millions of years. And, and the, the diversity in the number of coronaviruses in bats is thought to be indicative of the fact that they've co-evolved with each other over, over thousands, millions of years. And so it's very likely that the coronavirus that we're struggling with at the moment is from is from bats in some way. And there, there has been some evidence, no direct links at all have been found, but um, what are viruses, coronaviruses which have been isolated from rhinolophus bats, which are the ones with a very cute nose, nose leaf, mm. they, um, they're about 96 to 98% similar to the to SARS COVID to the correct the one that causes COVID nineteen, but no okay. exact link has been found. So we don't we don't know exactly how this happened, but it's likely that because coronaviruses are from uh, bats originally and co-evolved with them, mm -hmm. that they're probably very connected to the source. But we don't know how that's happened. Right, exactly. Um, thank you for for making that so clear. Um, so by by the sounds of it, bats are as much a victim as as any other animal. That it is totally nothing to do with their, their fault at all. Absolutely, it's it, it, you can't kind of go around animals for just doing their thing. You know that all animal, all uh, animals on the planet, all species on the planet have pathogens of some kind circulating in their in their bodies including us right and it's they're just doing their thing and it's it's how we as humans are connecting into uh, bat populations which is the problem so it's about our activities interacting with them rather than bats themselves like it could be pangolins or gorillas or whatever they're just minding their own business and yeah. it's our activities which are causing this problem Right. OK, so um, talking about um, like viruses jumping from one species to another, um, what kind of ways that can happen? Can that happen uh, in the natural world? How do these pathogens jump from one creature to another? Yeah, well, the, you know, um, pathogens circulate in wildlife popula in species populations all the time, just like in us, you know, like from jumping from. Uh, animal to animal, uh, individual to individual like us, you know, so just the same kind of ways. And But there are lots of different routes for that to happen. So you can get uh, pathogens from direct uh, transfer of, of fluids, mm. but also, um, you know, through blood or from uh, urine of feces or respiratory, respiratory pathogens can spread. And at this, this um, uh, picture here is just showing you how that might relate to when you've got transfer from animals to people. So, you know, there are lots and lots of pathways that I just mentioned, but this time it's between a, a, a different species and, and humans. So it's just about when those, those transmissions happen. So, you know, for the, for the majority of, of pathogens that which go into, into it, it go from animal to different species to different species, nothing happens like it happens all the time and nothing happens because they can't get in you don't get exposed you you need all your immune system picks up and deals with it so the, the vast majority of these these jumps just don't cause any problem at all and it's just those very few pathogens which you can probably all name <laughs> you know you've all heard of which yeah. cause this problem so i think it's it's just when um, the pathogen can get into your immune system, get past all the defences, that's when it causes a problem. Right. And sometimes, you know, mo most of those events, you know, often just stay uh, within the human. So, for example, things like um, rabies, you get that from an animal, but then you can't pass that on or very, very rarely. Or something like Lassa fever, which is like, a, it's kind of a similar to Ebola, and it's transmitted by rats. They, uh, it, the, the virus just stays in you and you can't pass that on. And then a very, very tiny proportion of those pathogens can then go on to infect humans. So like Ebola, for example, and SARS-CoV-2, those are, those are exceptional, exceptional pathogens or very rare pathogens, which can make the not just make the jump and infect you and cause a problem, but then get into a transmission route in your body to infect somebody else. 
So those are very rare. Right. OK, so um, we've we've had some fantastic questions already coming <laughs> through. Um, uh, we had one from Lisa, which was how do viruses transfer to humans? So we've we've covered that the way that viruses transfer from one animal to another, including humans. But I think that what would be great to to explore a bit more here is that when we're talking about viruses uh, in the wild world, uh, there's lots of animals coming into contact with, with each other through predator-prey relationships and that sort of thing. But but why are humans um, coming into contact with these wild animals? And how is that happening? How is it actually jumping from people who we might think are a bit separate from the system, but are we actually? <laughs> well, humans are an integral part of the system. So it's not just like, you know, pristine rainforest and a city you know there's so many interfaces between a forest and a city you know the suburbs uh, you know a farm on the edge of the forest you know um, lots of um, intensive farm um, practices like huge numbers of domestic species interacting with wildlife and then those those domestic species acting as a kind of amplifying host it's called and it, it they go into the domestic species and then go into us so we're creating these really, uh, a really substantial number of different interfaces um, as we, you know, change change the planet and 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 convert the planet into human activities. Right. Okay. So basically, these viruses are out there, but the main issue is that we are encroaching upon the habitats and the wild world in which these animals live in. Um, okay, so yeah, so, so it's domestic, domestic, domestication of animals has caused a huge number of extra individuals in this, in the, you know, in the environment, which can also interact with wild animals, and then they can jump; those pathogens can jump from them into us. Also, we go into wild areas and and do say bushmeat hunting, and the act of kind of getting something, cutting it up, could could spill over into a uh, pathogen could could jump into us. So that there are there are a huge number of different routes um, that you could that could be you know promoting these jumps between animals and people, and we're creating these interfaces which are quite risky. Okay, right. So um, I think it'd be a good time to see if we've got any more questions from the audiences at home. I see that there's quite a few coming in. For anyone who's just joining us, we've got Professor Kate Jones live in the studio with us. And we're taking your questions about the relationship between animals, uh, viruses and humans. So we've got a question from Claire. Um, what implications will the COVID-19 pandemic have on the bat populations around the world? Do we expect to see more rigid controls on bat populations around human environments? Gosh, that's a really good question. Is, um, I think I... I've been trying to kind of promote the message that it's it's not any particular animal's fault about you know this pandemic. You know, it's not one particular species or one particular group of things. It's more to do with our activities, and I think that that's got to change. You know, our activities mm -hmm. need to change. We need to think more carefully about you know how we use the land and our interfaces between wildlife and humans and. Bats are maybe uh, responsible for some of these pathogens which are jumping into humans, but they're just one part of the <laughs> possible <laughs> hosts out there that have all of these all these pathogens and viruses. So it's it's not just bats; it's all of wildlife. It's all of it's all of the planet. All have pathogens circulating. So it's about how we holistically think about how our activities are um, are, in, are are changing and so we're we're at higher risk of having these jumps happen so it's not one particular species it's 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 our our system our human and wildlife system that needs to change right okay that sounds i think that sounds really uh interesting i think we'll We'll probably explore that a little bit more uh, <laughs> later on. Um, we've got another question from uh, Angela. Uh, how do the pathogens affect the animals themselves? I think that's quite a 
complex question as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just take it from um, the bat's point of view yeah. uh, for, say, the coronaviruses. So because they've evolved with them, like we've evolved with the common cold, for example, um, that there's some evidence that that was more virulent and more dangerous uh, in the past, and we've evolved to cope with it. And I think that's true for many species which have co-evolved with pathogens over a long period of time. Um, they become, you know, you deal with them. Um, so I think that um, not, not just bats, maybe not just focus on them, but just wildlife mm -hmm. cope with um, pathogens as they, you know, as they co-evolve with them. And I think it's the ones which are then new. They jump from animal to animal, animal to, to people. That's when the, the biggest issue arises because we're not, we haven't got the immune systems to cope with these, these new viruses or new pathogens. So right. I think... In general, you know, um, wildlife and us, we co-evolve with pathogens and we cope with them. But if so if something changes, it's a new thing we haven't been exposed to. That's that's the big issue. Right. OK. Um, fantastic questions, everyone. Just keep them coming. We'll come to many more uh, later on the show. Um, OK, so. We're talking about how these pathogens and these viruses jump from animal populations into uh, humans, which is a huge part of your research. And the idea of risk is a fundamental concept to understanding how these pathogens might jump from animals to humans. Um, I think we might have an image of this, which would be a great guide uh, for everyone at home. Um, I believe that there are three main factors that interact with each other. Um, to increase uh, risk. Can you uh, briefly uh, tell us a bit about the <laughs> hazard section of that? Yeah, I guess it, it looks a bit more complicated on that image than it is really. But <laughs> I guess the, the idea really is that when you, when you think about risk, like climate change risk or flood risk or earthquake risk, you typically think about it in three ways, like three three parts to the risk to make up the risk, which is, which, is the, which is the hazard. So what's the cause of this thing happening? What's the kind of exposure? So how many people are, are actually exposed to the hazard? And then you think about, well, how vulnerable are those people to this hazard and how and, and kind of resilience um, plays a part in assessing vulnerability. So that's how how we do it when we think about climate change risk. And this is an image from um, a paper uh, that came out last year that my group put together. And we started to think about disease risk as just one of these other risks to humans and think about it in that way. And I think it's really been helpful in trying to partition up what's actually going on. And, and actually it's helped us think about how to predict it into the future. So hazard is, is just the likelihood of a of a, an animal, an individual, wildlife species or a domestic species having a pathogen which can make it through all of these, you know, Swiss cheese, a lot of barriers <laughs> towards <laughs> us, right? So it's got to go through the immunological barriers, replicate in, in humans and pass on. To the, so what's the, what's the hazard? So that's about, you know, how many individuals are in that um, area? What's the seasonality? What's the abundance? and how are kind of global changes impacting on where these animals are. So that's the kind of hazard part. Um, and what's really interesting about the hazard part is that we're, we're uh, studies that in my group and, and lots and lots of other people around the world have been finding that if you start degrading landscapes, so you think about uh, land use change happening in the, the ecosystem, if you, if you start changing the land use and the ecosystems and um, degrading the ecosystems, the animal communities start changing. And um, a lot of species just can't cope with that at all. They just get filtered out. Some species really like it and change in abundance. So some species go up, some species go down. And evidence, is suggest evidence so far is suggesting that the disease, the species which are impacted by, you know, the, the changing landscapes and do better in these degraded landscapes tend to have life histories which are 
they live fast, they die young, or they can disperse wide areas, so they're not so impacted on about these changes. And they're species which have a higher probability of passing pathogens onto us. So they they carry more human pathogens which can infect us. So it looks like we're well, as we change these landscapes and change the species communities present, we're creating unhealthy ecosystems because they're the species which are doing well and tend to be able to pass these pathogens over to us. So it, it's a it's a kind of moving <laughs> a moving window of, of understanding how land use change is changing ecological communities to change the hazard. But hazard is only one part of this. So you have right. to think about it in terms of exposure, how many people are in the landscape and also how, you know, how vul vulnerable they are. Right. Um, so when we're talking about the, the degradation of these natural habitats, what are some of the, the practices and activities that are really driving this? Um, so if you think about um, deforestation, for example, you're creating uh, new areas of agriculture. It could be that you're, um, you're, you're uh, changing the landscape so that some species just can't cope with those areas. And then you've got species like rodents or some bats, some carnivores that do really well in these degraded landscapes. And those are the species which are then, you know, can pass these pathogens onto us. So an example could be say rice paddy farming. So in Southeast Asia, uh, a lot of um, irrigation is going on to change some of these areas into rice paddies, so producing more food. And that's creating more habitats for things like uh, mosquito vectors, which may be um, spreading Japanese encephalitis, for example, or dengue fever, or, you know, so I think the land use change in agricultural practices might be uh, a really big generation of, of, uh, of these spillovers. Also, things like Lassa fever, for example, this Ebola-like disease, um, the host is an agricultural pest. It's, um, it's a really cute rat, actually, Mastermis oh. teliensis, but um, it thrives in these areas where in West Africa, where there's lots of um, of growing of crops and the villages are nearby. And so you increase the kind of um, the amount of pests you have, uh, the rodent populations, and then, um, you know, they, they transfer this virus through feces and urine um, as people are harvesting the, the crops. So there's um, really interesting dynamic there in um, increasing food security, which is, you know, obviously really brilliant for those those human populations but yeah. there's, there's a side effect there that they're increasing their exposure to that the exposure to pathogens which may spread from animals into people right so lots of interconnected systems basically it's a very very complex issue um looking to the future um climate change will be putting increased pressure on on certain communities around the world, as well as the ecosystems. Is, is the risk of infectious diseases going to be exacerbated by the effects of climate change as we as we keep going forward? Yeah, if you put that figure up again, I'll just explain how that might happen. Um, so uh, if you if you if climate's changing, you might be changing the the exposure of the people that are um, being exposed to the hazard so that they could be changing their life livelihoods, for example. So say um, that that crop is, the, that agricultural practice that they were doing is no longer viable in that region. They may start to do more bushmeat hunting, for example, so, or um, be involved in more wildlife trade to, to try to secure food systems, to, food, to increase their food security. Um, so climate change could act on the exposure, for example, but it also could, Act on vulnerability. So, um, if they were, if climate change was was making you less resilient to um, infectious diseases in general, then that would also increase the overall risk of, of getting these diseases. So, it could also be that climate change is putting more strain on the health services, so that you don't have as many health services to the general population. So, less investment in infectious disease research or response. 
And also, finally, climate change is changing the landscape. So it's, ch it's changing the ecosystems where some species will be responding quite well to new climate um, conditions and others will be not liking it at all and so decline. So again, you're changing the ecological communities. Um, and actually, we're not really sure if that's a, pl a plus or a negative at the moment because we don't quite understand, um, you know, which... Um, what the climate change effect is going to be on the important host and vector species. So in some, um, some cases, the um, vectors, for example, of dengue fever, these mosquitoes, massively increase um, with, with land use change and climate change. And we've seen a, um, an enormous increase in dengue fever over the last few years. But then in other cases, malaria, for example, they seem to be you know, not liking these new conditions and going and, de and declining, but trying to kind of pass out the um, effects of control of um, investment in, um, you know, hospitals and medical treatments from the climate change signal is quite tricky and land use signal is quite tricky. And I think that's a really interesting area to explore in the future is the slight this interface between these global change drivers and hazard exposure and vulnerability. I really like this framing because you can kind of put all of the things that we have been talking about, you know, with the, with COVID and pandemic and deforestation and domestic species and food and farming all into one framing. And I think it, it, it makes it much easier to understand for people trying to then predict what's going to happen next. Absolutely. I think this is a, a really useful way of, of framing it too. Um, I, we're going to take another look at some of the uh, audience questions. No, actually, there's a great one that will help us uh, lead into the final part of the, 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 um, the event today. Uh, a question from William. Uh, what is a priority for us to change and avoid future outbreaks? Is that a complete sentence? <laughs> <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think, I think basically, um, what what are the, the certain areas that are best to oh, target? Right, okay. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a really good point. Um, I I think we need to do a bit of um, of an assessment. Actually, I think we don't know that yet. We we need mm -hmm. to think about what are the the riskiest pathogens and where are they what hosts are they in so for example we could think about coronaviruses and then map those out then we need to think about where are most people or most domestic species what are those routes so can we map that out can we then think about um where are the most vulnerable people so it's not just about um you know, where are, how many people they are, but how vulnerable those people are, as we've seen with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we need to think about doing that globally, like where are those hotspots? You know, where can we think about, it, you know, helping on each part of those, that the hazard exposure and the, and the vulnerability. So I think some work needs to be done on that. And I think that some of these, pathogens as I showed you have have different routes of transmission and yeah. involve different species and so we really need to think about how all of that interacts like how species life history interact with its pathogen or its capacity to spill over how does it react to climate change and land use change and then how does that interact with vulnerability and exposure so at the moment I think that's a very long, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's very long, I don't know. But I think we could get to approximation of that um, and start to invest in some, um, in those areas. And and to some mm. extent, the, the, I, I published a paper in, in 2008, which did a kind of, uh, a simple version of this, not the kind of uh, hazard exposure and vulnerability framework, but just a kind of simple plotting of, where in the past have uh, these diseases emerged into the human population and what were the kind of spatial correlates of that? What was it the environment? Was it the number of people? Was it the number of, of, of other species there? And what we were showing was a relationship between rate of population growth 
and um, the, and high biodiversity areas. <clears throat> so uh, this map really started to change the conversation about priority setting and put different areas of the world where in the past our patterns showed that you know this was a risky area and then mm. that led to a huge investment in money in, in securing those health systems or putting more money into those health systems but also surveillance of different species within those areas so that you knew what the, the hazard was but that didn't really take into account changing land use in the future and also climate change and socioeconomic changes and vulnerability so right. I think we need to redo that <laughs> to, mm. to then start to think about where those areas could be but right. yeah, really interesting question and yeah it's something that we need to do yeah th th these are absolutely fantastic questions we've actually got one that that follows up quite nicely from Kyle um, <laughs> thinking from a more of a social point of view uh, do you think that we need to change our relationships with environments and ecologies? Um, and if so, what sort of change do you think is most pressing? Quite, quite a big one, again. Yeah, quite a big one. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's one that I, I, I'm often asked and, you know, I always do a terrible job of answering. But um, I think at the heart of this is a lack of understanding of the interconnectedness between people, nature and ecosystems and nature. And we need to do a much better job at valuing nature as an asset. So nature and ecosystems are an asset and we're changing them and degrading them to our cost. And I think we need to put that cost, internalize that cost into our economies. So, you know, the pandemic has caused God knows how many billions across trillions across the world. How much would it have been to not deforest that area or not put that cotton farm in or not yeah. to do something you know so I think we need to know what the true cost of our activities the cost and the consequences of our activities and disease outbreaks have never really been in that framing you know yeah. so when you think about oh I'm going to set up a farm cut this forest down and do this you don't think oh but I might get a disease you know that's so far out of your calculation but there needs to be some understanding of that and I, and I think there are some really massive win-wins win because yeah. restoring ecosystems and restoring a natural balance to the you know the number of individuals and what species are present can also help nature-based solutions for climate change for example and I think there are win-wins to be had here and I think the policymakers are starting to take notice of that and I think that's that's really brilliant I don't even know what the question was then. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, uh, yeah. I so much. <laughs> There's so much to cover, isn't there? Um, actually, just just on that point, uh, we had an event uh, in February uh, with uh, Dr. Adriana De Palma and Professor Andy Purvis from the museum about that exact topic. So, if anyone um, who's watching this is interested in that subject, um, that's available on our website, and there should be a link uh, coming up in the chat soon as well. So. Definitely check that out if you're interested in, in that side of the conversation. Um, oh, we've got time for maybe just a, a few more uh, questions. Um, uh, we've got we've got a great one here. What is a simple thing everyone can do to reduce the likelihood of future pandemics? Simple thing that everyone can do. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing some quick modelling in my head. Um, <laughs> I would say probably uh, stop eating meat would probably the, be the biggest thing because the causal the causal links there are things about deforestation and changing habitats. It's also um, a win win for um, it's a win win for climate change as well. So that uh, beef is one of the the biggest. Um, you know, climate emitting, um, carbon emitting agricultural practices. So, you know, I do appreciate that um, eating meat is a huge cultural thing across the world. So I'm not trying to be um, dictatorial about it. But if we think about that and how much climate impact it has, how much kind of land use change impact it has, and um, 
perhaps that's one thing that we could do. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, one last thing before we have to wrap up. Um, do you think that this moment uh, is is truly a, a turning point for for us all, as um, some people have echoed, where where as as a species we start to really take the notice between the link um, between ecological damage and disease outbreaks? Are you seeing those conversations happening now? <laughs> I, I am, and, and not just not, not just because of this, but before a few years before this happened, you know, I, I've been banging on about this for for most of my professional life. Yeah. But um, I've seen the conversation changing, and I stood in in um, on the South Bank, you know, one of the pro, one of the Extinction Rebellion protests, just seeing. I think were a lot of my students <laughs> doing lots of protests. <laughs> And and I was like, gosh, this would never have happened a few years ago. And that yeah, I and I came away from that just feeling really elated and like we've actually got a voice and it's it's kind of the message which we're going on about has has taken root. And I think people are very uh, I think people are more powerful than they think they are. I think that having a voice and taking a stand leading by example and pressuring your MPs who respond to people pressuring them that's their whole job that's how we make changes you know and having you know having just having hope and thinking that this we can change this and the the conversations and the 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 movement of policy is so fast at the moment like that the conversations I've been having with policymakers, with number 10, you know, all these things are amazing, are amazing. And it's because people, like people that are watching this, are saying, this is not right and we need to do something about it. So I think you're very powerful people and you need to you know, take a stand that this isn't right and, and talk to your MPs because it, it does actually work. <laughs> well, in most, in most countries. That was a fantastic way to end it Kate I'm afraid that we're just out of time uh, so we're gonna have to wrap things up thank you so much for joining us all it's been so fascinating for me and I'm sure everyone else at home has loved it as well thank you so much pleasure it's, it's been great to talk to you okay um and just finally uh thank you to everyone at home who participated in this discussion too. Um, some of those questions were absolutely fantastic. Uh, apologies, we didn't manage to get to them all. And uh, last but by no means least, uh, a huge thanks to those who've donated. Um, if you have enjoyed the show, please do consider making a donation, no matter the amount. It's so appreciated by all of us at the museum and it helps us to bring you uh, more content uh, like this. Um, also, if you have a moment, we would love to know what you thought of this event. It's really important to us, so we can ensure that we're giving you the kind of content that you're looking for. Um, uh, so for, please uh, feel free to pop some feedback in the chat or contact us through our website. And if you'd like to discover more about the Our Broken Planet program, including upcoming events, keep an eye on our social media channels and our website, which we keep regularly updated. You'll find a link for that in the chat too. Uh, once again, thank you from all of us at the Natural History Museum to Professor Kate Jones and all of you at home for tuning in. Bye-bye.